It's going to be a good year, isn't it? Pastor Matt just talked about doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. Let me take 12 seconds to kind of explain that. Maybe fasting or the idea of that is new to you. Of course, even in the health, they talk about intermittent fasting and stuff like that. But it's 21 days of really just saying no to some things in my flesh. And my brother loves him some ribeye steak. I love some fajitas. I know I'm not helping for those of you that are fasting right now. Chocolate cake. So what we typically just encourage, you can do this at any level you want to. I was talking to uh, one of our guys. He did water for three days. I'm like, whoo. I didn't even do coffee. How do you live? How do you do that, right? But just at some level say, I want to say no to some things for a season. And here's the deal. You got to trust the process. You really do. You got to commit to the process and trust the process. We keep it simple. Because like, it, by the time you're day 16, you'll be fighting with your wife. Eggs aren't on the fast. You're like, just keep it simple. You know what I'm saying? So for a lot of us, it's just no meats and no sweets. And a lot of times that means including pop and cutting all that out. So maybe like this is the first time you're hearing about that. Jump in and just finish this thing strong with this. And, and we just believe it's not, it's, not, it's not for the church, for you. It's for your spiritual life and just something that God. I just want to take a minute to explain that. I am feeling better. I wasn't here for our Renew Night on Wednesday night. And the doctor says I ain't got no Rona. So amen to that. Like probably breaking HIPAA violations right there. But um, started day two after, you know, we kind of call it the Christmas cold. So two days after Christmas, my wife went down. She's still down, still kind of has acute pneumonia. My daughter has double ear infection. So she didn't get to go to school last week. But we said, hey, we got to go make sure we ain't got Rona. And so I failed that test. Thank goodness. It's a test you want to fail. And now I've actually been feeling better for a couple of days, so appreciate Pastor Matt and his leadership on Wednesday night and uh, just bringing the work. And so I'm glad to be here with you today, and we're going to be a little bit all over the place. We're in a new series called It's My Year, and this is the year. It's really the year to kind of jump in and do some things, and I'm going to start John 1, going to land in John 8, eventually get to Galatians 5. If you're a Bible bringer, I want to kind of give you a heads up to where we're at, Galatians 5 and John 8 will be the bigger places where we spend that time. And John, when he talks about the birth of Jesus, I know we just came out of the Christmas season and he tells the nativity story, John tells it a little bit differently than Matthew and Luke do. Of course, they start at when Mary's getting pregnant and, and the conversations with Joseph and the trip to Bethlehem. John goes all the way back to creation. And John is setting a very deep theological argument that Jesus has always been. Like Jesus didn't just begin when Mary got pregnant. John says, listen, all the way back before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus was there. And John 1, verse 1, very famous, says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. Okay, he's going to define what the Word is here in just a minute. The Word was with God and the Word was God. John 1, 14, it tells you who he's talking about when he says the Word. It's, it's his replacement. He's like, so John 1, 14 says, so the word became human, meaning he's Jesus. He's, when he says in the beginning, the word already existed, in the beginning, Jesus already existed. So, the, so Jesus became human and made his home among us. And he was, catch this, he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. Now that's beautiful, right? That's the way the New Living Translation says he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We've seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Now, that's the newer translation. Like, I read out of the New Living. I preach a lot out of the New Living. But if you've been in church for a long time, that, that's kind of a newer translation. So let me go grab one of the older translations. It, let me grab the NIV. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's Jesus. Okay? We've seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. He says this, full of grace and truth. Now, what the New Living Translation called unfailing love, the older translations called grace. What the New Living Translation called faithfulness, the older translation calls truth. Jesus was the Son of God. And John 1.14 says that he came, and when he came, he was full of grace and he was full of truth. Put another verse up on the screen found in 1 John, the letters of John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, and it says, those who say they live in God, like if you say I'm a Christian, I've given my life to Christ, I've surrendered to him, I, I, I want to live according, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. 
That's part of being a Christian is, listen, I, I, I know I got sin in my life. I know I'm going to fail. I know but I, I should strive to do what Jesus did. I should strive to live as Jesus. If we say we're followers of Christ, we need to do our best to strive to live as Jesus did. And Jesus was full of grace and truth. There's something that happens every January when we turn the page on the calendar every new year. There's just like hope in the coming months. We're, we're glad close the chapters of the previous year, and, and we just, we just kind of have and just, just kind of a fresh start. I mean, it's just another day. January 1 is just another day, but there's just kind of this hope of the coming year and what it'll bring. And then in that, there's some, this is the year we'll get a better handle on my finances until the credit card bills come in from what you spent on the kids at Christmas, and then it just all goes out the window, right? But this is the year maybe I'm going to lose a few of those pounds. This is the year I'm going to be more disciplined with my schedule. I'm going to be more disciplined, intentional family time or intentional in those priority relationships. And there's always some hope. There's always this thought that this is the year. This is the year I'm going to make things better. And, and maybe you, you jump into something like a 21 days of prayer and fasting or, or the first 15. The first 15 is where we take kind of the first 15 minutes of the day. I, I got to be honest with you, Matt. It's really my third 15 because I got to have a shower to wake up and then I got to have that cup of coffee. Come on, somebody say Amen. Right? So for me, it's the third 15, but it's early in the day. I mean, it's the, one of the first things I get to is I do five minutes of reading my Bible, five minutes of praying, and then five minutes of just listening to worship music. Maybe worship music, can't you think? It's fine. Just, just trust us on this. Just try this. Just try this five minutes of reading your Bible, five minutes of just praying and talking to God, and five minutes of just letting worship music get into you. Let's be honest, the last couple of years, and even this year, it kind of feels like we're running with ankle weights. It kind of feels like we're running, but I'm carrying a backpack that's just weighted down. And some of that, probably a good part of that, comes from this pandemic, from COVID. It's just made life harder. I want, to think, I want you to think about what COVID has cost us. COVID has cost us consistency. It is so hard to plan. It's so hard to plan a big event. It's so hard to plan a vacation. It's so hard to plan a trip. You don't know if you're going to get to go, if they're going to close it down. My daughter, her band, they're supposed to be going to California in the spring. Who knows? Like, they have a plan B. If California's not, who, who knows? Like, people that would, like, go down to Cozumel or take cruises or, or what? Who, it's just so hard to be consistent. Will it be open? What will I have to do once I get there? Once I get there, will things close down? It's been two years since we have been on an international mission trip. We have Guatemala on the books for this summer, but that's not 100%. No guarantee that that's going to happen. Blasted Rona, it just makes it hard to plan. So you just do your best. You plan the best you can. You pray. You cross your fingers. And you move forward the best you can. No big deal, right? But actually, after two years, it kind of becomes a deal. It kind of becomes just this frustration of the lack of consistency that we can't really 100% plan for big things. Then it's cost us relationally. It's cost us in our relationship because of the risk of getting COVID or spreading COVID. There are some people in your life that are just gone. You haven't seen them in a long time. Maybe there's some family members that you just don't get to see as often. Our normal social rhythms have been just disrupted or the unimaginable. And I would guess the vast majority of us in this room know someone or lost someone from COVID. We quickly learned isolation is not good. We discovered quarantines cost us relationally, which tips the next domino. It cost us mentally, just mental health through this whole COVID thing. It just brought this silent stress. It caused consistency. We said we can't plan things. It cost us relationally because we're isolated. And it just slowly started to build into stress. And there's been seasons. My life, I was just frustrated. I didn't even know why. It was just, it was just this frustration that you can't put your finger on it. COVID brought division. Tired of fighting about masks or not wearing masks. Tired of fighting, are you vaccinated or not been vaccinated? So last summer, we sent our youth off to youth camp, and it turned into a spreader. It did. And so the Thursday before Sunday church, we started hearing from dream team from people who were going to be serving that 
hey, we have COVID, we've been exposed to COVID, we're not going to be there. I'm not talking about 20 people that weren't coming to church. I'm talking about knob turners, button punchers, guitar players. And, and literally on that Thursday, we had over 20 dream teamers, volunteers, to say, we can't be there Sunday. We, we got to the point where we couldn't fill all the positions. And so Wisdom kind of said, whoa, 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 well, hey, let's just pause. Let's just hit the brakes here. And, you know, we had a spreader of COVID at camp. We don't want to bring that to church on Sunday. It's middle of the summer. Let's just hit pause and take a Sunday off. Okay? And then we got criticized for giving into political agenda. And then we got criticized for being coward. COVID has mentally just worn us out. Then there's the financial side of it. COVID has cost us financially. Pew Research released an article that said 44% of Americans, things got financially worse for them during the pandemic. Most of them think it will take at least three years to recover. 10% of them said they will never recover from what COVID cost them. And think about the small businesses or small restaurants, mom and pop shops that, that just had to close down. Maybe it was going to happen in the next seven to 10 years anyway. I, I don't know, but COVID cost them. And I know there's, there's part of it, oh, I don't know about that. You kind of want to push back on that. Like the government's hand out, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, listen, good for you. Maybe your life wasn't impacted. Maybe you're part of the 66. But for 44%, almost half of Americans, they were financially, they were furloughed. They were laid off. Their job changed. Something happened that impacted their life. And COVID brought financial stress. Then there was the marital stress in our marriages. Between July and October of 2020, divorces increased by 122% from the previous year. In June of this year, there was a 136% increase in people seeking legal advice and counseling about the divorce. 136%. Remember two weeks to flatten the curve? And we're two years into stress and struggle. And by everything I read, I don't think there's going to be a VC day. You know, at the end of World War II, there was a VE day where people lined the streets and there were parades and soldiers went marching through the streets of America. We celebrated victory in Europe, VE day. And then we had a VJ day, a victory over Japan. There's not going to be a VC day. There's not going to be a parade where we have victory over covid there's not going to be a day where we just wake up and COVID is gone. The pandemic is over. It's going to be a gradual climb out of this pandemic. And it may come to an end in 2022. I certainly pray it does. Amen. But the impact it will have will last for years to come. So I can't control what happens to me. But I can control what it does in me. And I can control how I respond. Even in my life, there are times that COVID has brought on a defeatist mentality. Why stinking fly? You can plan an event, but it'd probably all be canceled in a moment. We won't get to do it anyway. We won't get to go on the trip anyway. So let's not waste the time. Let's not waste the emotional energy getting excited about it. And I bought into defeatist mentality brought on by COVID. So I have a choice. I can give into it, and there's times I have given into it, or I can grow from it. And this is the year, after two years of this mess, this is the year I need to make the decision that I'm going to grow. Because the last few years, we ain't done a lot of growing. We've done a lot of waiting. We've done a lot of stressing. We've done a lot of fighting and arguing. But what if, what if this is the year I get better? What if this is my year to grow. This is the year I'm finally going to spiritually grow. What does that even look like? You still with me? Say amen. Second Peter chapter 3. One more verse. We'll throw up on the screen. Then we're going to get to those bigger passages. Second Peter 3. And, and Peter is writing to Christians. He's writing to people like you and I. And he's giving them some reminders about what living life in the faith is like and what being a Christian should look like. And he says, oh, but you know all that. Listen, here, just grow in grace. Just grow, there's that word grace again. Just grow in grace. As a matter of fact, grow in the knowledge of who Jesus is. And to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. 
2 Peter says, I need to grow in grace. I need to know what it's like to be more like Jesus. Remember 1 John 2, 26? If I'm going to be a Christian, if I'm going to be a follower of Christ, I need to strive to live like Christ. Remember for, or John chapter 1, verse 14, that Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. So if this is the year that I'm going to grow, I'm going to try to be more like Jesus, I need to be full of grace and truth. I'm going to give you, if you're one of those note takers, we give an outline every week, I'm going to give you the first two blanks back to back. Okay? Never done this before. Build the suspense, right? So number one is I'm going to, if I'm going to grow this year, I need to grow in grace. Number two, I'm going to grow in truth. I mean, if I would have given you the first one, you would have, oh, the suspense is killing me. What's the second one? You would have known that. I've been beating, beating that head last three minutes. You know, I need, I need to grow in grace, and I need to grow in truth. And what does that look like? So I want to take you to John chapter 8. And even as I was prepping that this week, I realized that at least once a year, I preach this passage. I love this passage. It is so powerful. It hits right to the heart. And the picture of Jesus of who we see he is. And so John chapter 8, and so many of the stories about Jesus and how he ministers and talks to people, they go, they hit right at the heart. And this is definitely one of those very powerful moments. John chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple, and a crowd soon gathered, and he sat down, and he taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious laws and the Pharisees, Okay? These are kind of the bad guys in the story. When you hear religious teachers and Pharisees, you kind of want to go, boo, because these were the guys that were always trying to trip Jesus up. Okay? And so they're trying to trap him. They brought a woman who'd been caught in the act of adultery. She was cheap. And they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses says to stone her. Let me be clear. This is not like college things, medical card, not that stone, all right? They're saying she needs to be killed by throwing rocks and piling on her head, all right? So Jesus, this woman was cut. The law says she needs to, we need to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? They're trying to trap her, trap Jesus. And the religious folks, the Pharisees, you know, Jesus was full of grace, truth, and they were good with they were good, New Living Translation calls it faithfulness. They were good at the faithfulness. They knew the law of Moses. They worked hard to fulfill and keep the law of Moses. They strived to live right. The church word we use is righteous. They strived for righteous living. Grace and, grace and truth, they, they, had, they had the truth part down. To be honest with you, there's a reason why God gave Moses all those laws. There's a reason why there was rules about if somebody was caught in adultery, why it needed to be dealt with. Why it needed to be eradicated from the people, need to be eradicated from society. You don't let that stay among you. You don't tolerate immoral behavior. You, you deal with them. You, you discipline them. In this situation, just go ahead and stone them. Just eradicate them. Here's why. Because if we allow immorality among us, it will soon seep into every corner of society. This is why you have opinions about who your kids ought to be friends with. This is why you care who your friends date, hang out with, and marry. Sure, today we tolerate a woman that's caught in adultery. Tomorrow, if we don't deal with that, that could turn into rampant sex trafficking. Or that could turn into sexual abuse of minors. It's, all the laws aren't because God's a fun hater. It's because all of those rules were there for the protection of society and protection of, of the culture, protection of the innocent, because they would easily become the victims. And so the religious leaders and the teachers, they knew the truth. They strived to live by the letter of the law, and they were always more than willing to hold you accountable in keeping them. Verse 6. Verse says they were trying to trap him into saying something. That they could use it against him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. We don't know what he was writing. I wish, man, I wish. I wish we knew what he was writing. 
They kept demanding answers. Huh? Huh? What do you think, Jesus? Huh? She was caught in adultery, Jesus. He stood up, said, all right, but let the one of you who has never sinned go ahead and throw the first one. But then he stooped down again and he wrote the dust. And when the accusers heard this, I love it. They slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, those of us that are gray-headed, those of us that have a little more wisdom, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with one. So all the accusers, all the Pharisees, they left, and now it's just Jesus and this woman who's been caught in adultery, but there's still a crowd around them. Then Jesus stood up, and again he said to the woman, where are you accusing? Didn't even just one of them condemn you? And I, I'm probably reading too much into the story. But I like to just kind of close my eyes and go there for a moment. And you, you see her in her shame, probably not very well dressed. She turns her head up, probably tears running down her face. And her voice cracking is almost just a loud whisper. Oh, oh. love what Jesus did. It Go and sin no more. So many of the stories about Jesus and his ministry and how he relates to hurting people pierce right to the heart. They're so powerful. But this one, man, this one just to me has an awe factor. The wisdom he has in this moment to deal with the people trying to trap him, but the mercy and the compassion he has in this moment, it's absolutely beautiful. This moment is full of grace. And I think, for me, I think the turning point in this story happens around verse 8. The woman who, who caught him in adultery. By the way, there's no man here. You notice that? They just brought the woman. They didn't bring the man. They just brought the woman. They throw her at the feet of Jesus. She clearly broke the law. And you can make a case that it is for the good of society that we eradicate immorality. It's for the protection of the innocent that she be dealt with. You can make that case. And Jesus stoops down in the dirt and he starts writing. And I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew, I wish I knew. I mean, he could have been down there and he, he could have been like drawing up football plays in the backyard. All right, Peter, you're going to go up here and take a left. And then John, I want you to slant across. And when you get to there, you turn around, look, the ball's in here. I mean, he's probably drawing up football plays, but maybe not. I think, this is all BKV, Brent Kellogg version. I think he's writing words in the dirt like lust, lying, Dishonoring your parents, cheating, breaking the Sabbath. See, we, there's something in human nature we like to categorize sin. We've got big sin. And then we've got little bitty white lies sin. But the truth be told, they all allow for immorality to creep into our life and into society. They all separate us from right standing with God. Maybe it was the man that had her by the hair and he was the one that threw her at the feet of Jesus. But he had disrespected his aging parents in the last 24 hours, not helped them when they needed him most. And maybe Jesus, when he stooped down in the dirt, maybe he wrote dishonor the Father in heaven. Or maybe it was the guy that carried her by the feet and threw her down in the dirt in front of Jesus. He just lied to his son. Or really, really, it's okay. Jesus wrote in the dirt, Thou shalt not lie. After he's done writing, he raised his head. And he said, He who is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. She's right. You caught her. She's guilty. But that moment, him writing in the dirt, is a reminder to us. So am I. So are all of us. I love the imagery of that picture. One by one, they just drop their stone. Starting with the older, wiser, been through some stuff, they started to slip away. One by one. Verse 10, then Jesus stood up again and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And then I love, in one verse, in one verse, you see on full display what John 1.14 was talking about, that Jesus is full of grace and he's full of truth. In one verse, 
No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, then neither do I go and sin no more. Neither do I. He's full of grace. He had every right to throw the first stone. Jesus had not sinned. But in that moment, he's like, I don't condemn you either. He is full of grace. But then he says, go and sin no more. In that moment, he's full of truth. If you and I are going to grow this year, if this is my year, you kind of put corona in the rear view mirror. COVID, corona, yeah. And if this is my year that I'm going to grow in grace, We need the neither do I side of Jesus to come alive in our life. We need to stop expecting the world to live up to our expectations. I get to announce sporting events. Last night I was PA announcing a basketball game. And uh, it, was a, it was a tournament, so we'd been playing games for three days. And yesterday, there was a set of grandparents that are at this ball game. And after the game was over, their grandson's team lost. They went to the ticket booth and demanded a refund. Because <laughs> the game didn't go the way they thought it should go. That's funny. That's real. That's where we are as society. We are just always looking for something to live us into. We're like Velcro. Just everything sticks to us. And we need to stop expecting the world to live up to my expectations. We need to take the edge off of our emotions. We need to show compassion. We need to love our neighbor, whether they're wearing a mask or not vaccinated or yada, yada, yada. If I am a growing Christian, I should be growing and walking in grace. We need to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. It's singular. It's fruit, not like Walmart's, not plural. It's fruit. We need to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 says this, but the fruit, there's no S on that, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or forbearance, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Singular. Those aren't fruits of the Spirit. They're all collectively one. The fruit of the Spirit. See, because you won't see somebody who's walking in joy, but then they're filled with hate and anger. You won't see someone who's patient be unkind. You won't see someone who's gentle and then lose their self-control. These are all one Unattachable units. They all come together. And if I am going to grow in grace, I have got to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. And this is the year I need to let go. It's the year I need to unwind. Not be so wound up. Take a chill pill. Get past yourself. And let go of unmet expectations. Life is hard. Life is unfair. God's still good. Amen? Everybody say, I mean everybody, say I love BK. Now this side's feeling strong. Y'all are out of here? Y'all wait. Doug, did you say that? I don't think he said it. I'd have heard that. Listen, you can't be like Christ and be a jerk. But you can't. We don't have permission in Scripture. Jesus was always full of grace. He was always full of grace as he spoke. The truth. Neither do I. Go sin no more. I think what gives this story power and what speaks right to my heart is we love the grace, the unfailing love, the mercy, the compassion he shows to a woman that deserved punishment. We can all relate to be that woman in the dirt. Maybe not adultery, but I bet you one of our sins was written in the dirt there. It was written in the dust by Jesus. We've all had that Saturday night that we regret on Sunday morning. We've all had that conversation we never should have had. We've all had those seasons where we fell at the mercy of the feet of Jesus and something on the inside of us longed to hear the words, nor do I. There's a problem with grace and truth, okay? The problem is, is 
when the equation gets out of balance. The problem is, is when we land all just in grace, or when we land just all in truth. Jesus was full of grace, but he was also full of truth. Okay? See, grace without truth will not produce growth. I never get better. Oh, it's okay. Like, if, if there's never consequences for your kids, they never get better. If, if, if there's just grace without truth, there's no correction, I don't grow. But if I have truth without grace, it'll only produce resentment. All I hear is rules. All I hear is God's a fun hater. It feels impossible. It feels heavy. Listen, unconditional love still has a backbone. Grace still has a backbone. Jesus said, nor do I. Immediately followed by, now, go sin no more. God's got so much more for you than living a life in adultery. God wants to help you get better. I want to give you my spirit to empower you and see that your life, God created you for so much more than this. Grow in grace. Lord knows I need a lot of it. I need to be willing to give it. But this is year I'm going to grow in truth as well. This is year I'm going to strive to go and sin no more. This is the year I'm going to spiritually try to get better. This is the year I'm going to try to live by the fruit of the Spirit. But before the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, he gives another list of fruit, and it's called the fruit of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19, it says, the acts of the flesh, kind of obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. It's a naughty word, but kind of fun to say. God admit it. Somebody going to use that at lunch. Oh, the debauchery. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. I think you read that list. Sexual impurity, debauchery, adultery. We're pretty good, right? Like, not a lot of debauchery in here today, you know? I'm guessing if witchcraft is your thing, Sunday morning church probably isn't, right? Like, you might be mad, but hatred? I mean, we're pretty good with that list. Can we just stop right there? Oh, no. We have to go into discord and jealousy, bits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy. This list gets a little closer to home. Bits of rage? I saw you on I-44 in that construction the other day. Listen, you better wave at me with all your fingers next time. Because it's your boy. Dissension? I know, I know you're smarter than your boss. I know that. I hear you. So does the whole office. <laughs> Selfish ambition? What about me? I want my money. You're not going to treat my baby that way. I know they didn't do their homework, but that's not their fault. That's the teacher's fault. I'm going to get this fixed. I'm going to talk to your boss. Now I've gone from preaching to meddling, haven't I? Envy? We good? Like I can just say the word, like you need an example? I mean, we can talk about social media. I mean, I just, we good? I can go there. Paul gives this list of fruits of the flesh that, that, if we're honest, we can pull off that list. But then he gives the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. And then this is what he says right after he gives the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. This is what he says, Galatians 5, 24. For those who belong to Jesus, remember we've talked about that, if I'm gonna be like Christ, if, I'm, if I say I'm a Christian, for those of us that say we're Christians, we have nailed their sinful desires to the cross. Amen? And there comes a time. Friends, I'm telling you, there's hope. Some of you live in a world of constant temptation and struggle. I'm just telling you, the more you become like Christ, the more you do these things, there comes a point that you don't want to do the things anymore. There's hope. This is the year I'm going to deal with the thing. This is the year I'm going to deal with the sin. This is the year I'm going to throw off the weight that keeps tripping me up. Strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up. I'm going to grow in grace because Lord knows I need a lot of grace, but I'm also going to grow in truth. And the third blank tells you how to do that. If I'm going to be like Jesus, I need grace, I need truth, but the third blank tells me 
how I'm gonna, this, this is how I do this. Like some of you are like, I, I want this to be the year. And this is the year. Like I'm going to commit to going to church. This is the year I'm going to try to be generous. This is the year. How do I do that? And the third blank right here is going to tell you, okay? And I'm just going to tell you right now, you're not going to like it. And you can send that email to christomlin at gmail.com. Number three is I need to grow in discipline. You need to grow in discipline. God wants to help you. God wants to help you. God, the Bible says in Ephesians that when we're saved, we're sealed with the power of His Holy Spirit. God wants to help you, but He's not going to do it for you. Let me show you this. Romans 8, 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Like if I'm a Christian, I have the Spirit of God. I was sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay? I am a child of God. I have God's Spirit. Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Can somebody say amen? The Holy Spirit helps me when I'm weak. Even in those moments of temptation, the Holy Spirit, he'll tell you, man, this is not, don't go down this road. He, he, the Holy Spirit will convict you. It's not heavy. That's condemnation. Oh, God's so mad if you do that. That's condemnation. The Holy Spirit will go, man, this is not your best move. 1 John 3, 24, the person who obeys Christ lives by the help of God because God lives in us. God wants to help you, but he won't do it for you. He puts his spirit in us to give us power, to help us, to convict us, to help us when we're tempted. He won't do it for you. Growth will not just happen. Let me remind you, moments ago, you said, these were your words, I love BK, all right? And this is how we know growth doesn't just happen. We could, this is a great time for all your eyes to be on me and elbows to your side. No, no poking anybody, all right? Growth won't just happen because we all know Christians who have been believers for a long time, but they're still very immature. If this is my year, I'm going to have to grow in discipline. So couldn't you, like, open up the Bible to, like, Obadiah? chapter two, and give us a secret code. Like if I took every third word of every word, you know, like no, there's no secret formula to doing this. You gotta roll up your sleeve and you've gotta do the discipline. You've gotta do the tough stuff. And so we're not trying to create busy work for you. We're trying to give you some things to do to help, like just two. Verse 15, get up, read your Bible, spend five minutes of prayer, and five minutes just letting worship music play over. 21 days of prayer and fasting. Not because the church needs you to do, because you need to do. We live in a day and a time where we easily confuse discipline with legalism. Well, pastor, I don't fast. It's just legalism. I can love God and love chocolate cake and fajitas at the same time. My turn. I love you. But legalism is an easy excuse for laziness. The vast majority of the kingdom doesn't read their Bible two minutes a day. And we start talking about just verse 15. Five minutes. Reading, five minutes of prayer, five minutes of worship. Oh, that's fine for you. I don't need that legalism in my life. Listen, maybe there's a reason why the church has lost its power. Maybe there's a reason why Christians are living so beat up and defeated. Maybe there's a reason why we don't have the fruit of the Spirit in our life. It's because we don't have the discipline in our lives to do the things that God's Word very clearly calls us and tells us to do. Remember, God's rules were for our protection, not because He's a fun hater, but it's to keep immorality from creeping into our lives and keep it from creeping into our society. We want to do it our way. We want our cake and eat it too. We want our chocolate cake and fajitas. But then when we hit crisis, God, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? He's like, I'm back over here in the 21 days of prayer and fasting that you said was legalism, but I was trying to do something in your life. God, where are you at? Lord, I just need a word. He's like, I'm here every morning in this Bible trying to feed your soul. You just got to get it out and open it and live in discipline to get it in you. We think discipline is legalism. I gotta tell you, there's times in our lives we gotta say no to the flesh. 
We got to say no to the chocolate cake and the fajitas and the ribeyes. There is a time I have to, what Paul says, I beat my body into submission. And if I don't, I'm going to produce a life that maybe starts with dissension. Maybe it starts with envy or selfish ambition. But the next thing you know, if I don't get in the habit of telling myself no to some things, then all of a sudden someone or something is going to come along and offer me something I shouldn't look at or something I shouldn't touch. And they're going to offer me some emotions that I shouldn't feel, but they give me all the tingles on the inside. And I'm going to wake up in debauchery. Laying naked and embarrassed with my sin exposed to the crowd around me, caught in my sin, just hoping I hear those words, nor do I. But the truth is, I never should have got there in the first place. This is the year I need to grow. I love you. Discipline is not legalism. It is the key to unlocking your growth. And I'm just asking you to do two. Just do two. Like, I have 21, we're, we're too late. It's okay. Have 41 days of prayer. I mean, 14 days of prayer. 41 if you want to. But have 14 days of prayer and fasting. Rona hit here. It's COVID-19, but it hit here in March of 20. I remember um, some of us had been to Kenya in February. And we came back and we're in Frankfurt, Germany, and it's on the news about all this leaking out of China. And we're walking through the airport and we're just a bunch of Okies from Oklahoma and we don't have no mask on. And like 70% of the people got masks. And I'm like, Whew, this is starting to feel like a thing. You know what I'm saying? And so like we get back and we have the two weeks to suppress the curve. And, you know, my kids went home from spring break and never went back. And, you know, COVID just kind of blew up. And then finally when August rolled around, we were so excited that we could even just get back to a little, it wasn't totally normal, but a little bit normalcy. Kids had to wear masks and social distance and all that, but, but we were going to get to play football, but there were some restrictions with that, and we were going to get to play softball and, and cheerleading and band and other activities, and that was Landon's senior year, and he was the section leader for his percussion section in their marching band. And since the time they were like 7th and 8th graders, they had been looking forward to this year as the largest band that they had ever marched had 26 seniors that had worked and stayed and worked hard and played together. And the previous year, in 2019, they had, for the first time in school history, achieved a sweet stakes. Big deal for them. And they were just so excited. And so finally, we get to the senior year, and man, they're just they're ready for this. But, but then, then you get out there, and one of the flute players, the flautist, gets Rona. And so the whole section has to be quarantined. Or, or one of the trumpet players tests positive for COVID. And the whole section has to be. And I'm just telling you, it's hard to be consistent with that. So they'd have a hard time practicing. They would have kids already gone for 10 days and come back and they would have pages of drill that's learned now. And, and so it's just hard. When it came time to go to competition, it's just hard. Judges knew that. I sometimes get to do PA work at those drum major and your band ready. You know, I get to, that's fun. I get to be up in the press box with the judges, I hear their conversation. I get to know some of them. We've done it several years. I get to know them and talk to them. And, and I would, either talking with them or I would hear them say, you know what, I talked to their band director on Friday. Their whole flute section's out tonight because of the kid that was quarantined. And the judges were so generous. They were so full of grace. They knew the struggle. Man, time and time again, they would say, because they, they'd give their comments in a recorder and they would begin by just saying, man, I'm so glad you guys made it. There were bands dropping day of or day before because too many of them were quarantined or had COVID, and they would just say, man, we're just so glad you're here. We're so glad you got to compete. Shows didn't get to be finished. I mean, it, it shows were half of what they used to be, and, and those judges just did the best they could. COVID had lowered the standard graciously. There were bands that normally at their best would, would score a, a low two or a three. That year, they got ones for just showing up. COVID created participation trophies. But rightfully, I mean, it was good that they actually pushed through and could get there. But in the process, they watered down the quality. And there's some good things to be said. Some good things about bands that still pushed through and got there. But my fear is that COVID has watered down the quality of our commitment. Over two years. As COVID watered down our faith. It is real. I don't know. I, like, I don't know. 
I'm a pastor. And like people will come and, and, and we won't see people three or four weeks. We don't know. We don't know if it's COVID or like, no, scared or are they not coming out of fear or are they coming out because they didn't drink too much beer? I don't know. Like, are you hanging on for life or are you hung over? We don't know. Time. Some time. In two years. Time. This is the year, regardless of what happens with Rome, another spike, another variant, another cron, whatever, I don't know. This is the time. I have got to make the decision. You've got to make the decision. Get back on the path. Let's just get back to the basics. Spiritual discipline is not legalism. It's necessary for growth. Let's be people full of grace. Good Lord knows we need grace. Let's show a lot of grace. Let's love our neighbor, whether they're vaccinated or not, whether they wear their mask. Let's, let's, just, let's just as Christians be different in this hour. Let's be people that are full of truth. God's grace does have a backbone. God forgives us when we miss the standard, but he still calls us to a standard. Amen, everybody? Let's grow in discipline. Time. COVID? Devil? <laughs> Satan? No mas. You've taken enough from the church. You've taken enough from godly families. You've taken enough from our lives. No more. Now is the time. This is the year. Today is the day. Amen, everybody? Hey, thanks for watching this sermon on our Hill Spring YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, take just a moment, hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single thing. Secondly, if this message has impacted you and you want to help reach others, visit our website at hillspring.tv. Hit that Give Now button to help us carry the hope of Christ around the world. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.